everybody. Tonight I want to speak to you about the credentials of leadership. And I'm sure if I were to go around the room and ask you all what leadership means to you, uh, you know, it's, we're all going to have different opinions on what leadership is. But the, the leadership I'm going to share with you is not just the pulpit ministry or being a leader in a corporation, but, the leader, but wherever you are, you can, you can step into a place of leadership. Amen? The platform does not have to be a pulpit. The platform can be wherever God places you. Amen? So wherever you're being used in the anointing, that is your place of leadership. And tonight's teaching is entitled, The Credentials of Leadership. Can you say that with me? The Credentials of Leadership. And the, the scripture I want to open with is from Hebrews chapter 5, verses, 5, um, verses 12 through 14. And it reads, For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong milk, I mean, not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Can you say that with me? Full age. full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised. Can you say that with me? Senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Amen? So tonight, I want, and Holy Spirit, I ask you to take over this meeting this evening. Lord, I just ask you that you'll be our teacher tonight and that we'll just follow your leading this evening and that I will not be in the way, but you will lead this class completely the way you choose tonight. Now, when we go into the depths of God's word and we really take the time to divide it rightly and to really understand it, that is when you start moving off of the milk away from the milk and going into the meat of God's word. Amen? And you know, many of us, especially early in our walk with God, will use scripture, but I'll, I call it like taking a vitamin pill. You know, if, if, you're la if your doctor tells you you're lacking in vitamin D or in iron or certain, you're, you're lacking in certain minerals, you, you'll take the supplements that will, that, that will put that back in your bloodstream, correct? Mm -hmm. Well, many of us treat the Word of God in the same manner, where if, if we're suffering with a sickness, we, we dig through the Bible and pull out all the scriptures on healing. If we're struggling with finances, we find the scriptures that deal with, 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 with uh, finances or, or whatever the condition is. And there's nothing wrong with that. I encourage every one of you to do that because I encourage all of you to live by the word of God. But there is a level beyond that. Most people don't go beyond that level of, of reading the word of God. And tonight, I want to encourage you to become very skilled and articulate in the word of God. Amen. The Word of God is not just for the preacher to reveal to you. Every one of us needs to take the time to dive into the Word of God and become skillful in it. Amen? Yes. Earlier today, I was just, I haven't listened to this teaching yet, but there was a rabbi that said he's going he's gonna to put together a teaching, and it's called the Forensics, no, he's going to call it Forensic uh, uh, Biblical Studies. Wow. The Forensics of the Bible, and that... Wow. That title just blew me away. And in fact, I'm going to steal that title on one of these Thursday nights. Because I, I love that title. Biblical Forensics. And I'm telling you, know, for, for example, when we read about Abram and, and his family coming out of Egypt with great wealth. And it talks about the land of the, the Canaanite land. And it says the Perizzites in the singular. But then later on in scripture, it talks about the Perizzites in the plural. See, that, that wasn't written by accident. That was, that was by, by divine purpose. So I need, to do, I need to go into my own biblical forensics to understand why that difference is in, within the text. Amen? And the more skilled you become in the Word of God, the more anointed you're going to become, the greater leader you're going to become, the, the, the more God's going to use you. And your sphere of influence is not just within church. It's wherever God places you. Yes. Wherever He places you. I don't know about you, but I spend 90% of my time in, 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 the, in the secular arena. I mean, I probably spend about 10% of my life within the church. And some of you see me in church all the time. You probably don't believe what I'm telling you, but it's true. I mean, only maybe 10% of my life is spent with, within, you know, within the four walls of, of a church building. But I want you all to become so skilled in the Word of God that the application for the Word of God is in every area of your life. In the, in, in, in the school, 
even if you're in, in if, even if you're in elementary school, God can use you in that place. Amen. Amen. And wherever you are, God God can God can increase your your sphere of influence, and He'll put the credentials of leadership upon you. Amen. So we are coming to a place, as the writer of Hebrews says, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Amen. So you look at your neighbor and say, you are, you are of full age. You are of full age. Don't call your neighbor old, but call your neighbor full of full age. Amen. And your senses are being exercised, and you're going to be able to, you are going to be able to discern between that which is good and that which is evil. So I want to give you a secular definition of leadership, the credentials of leadership. This is from an article that I read from Joseph Nye at Harvard. Now, Joseph Nye is a distinguished service professor at Harvard and author of The Powers to Lead and, 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 and other writings as well. And this is what he says. A leader is someone who helps a group create and achieve shared goals. Does that, that's a good one, don't you think? Some leaders act with formal authority of a position such as a president or a, or a CEO of a company, while others act without formal authority. And I'll give you an example of that. How many of you have heard about Rosa Parks? Yes. Amen? I think almost all of you have. She refused to give up her seat on a segregated bus and, lunch, and launch a bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. Amen. So she, she is an example of a leader without formal authority. Amen? So you don't have to wait for, your, you don't have to wait for the credentials. You don't need to re, re, receive the title PhD or, or, or pastor or, or whatever. Every one of you can, can move into the sphere of leadership. Amen? And look at the movement that Rosa Parks led. She stood up for that social injustice. Now, also from uh, Joseph Nye, he speaks about leadership and power. Leadership requires power, don't you, don't, don't you agree? It does re require some type of power. But many leaders think of power narrowly in terms of command and control. You know, some people run a very tight ship. And, 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 the, and, they, and they exercise the authority over people. Almost like a military type structure where your response is yes sir or yes ma'am, but it's a very strict uh, chain of command, right? Now, here's another example, and, and things have changed, especially with the advent of the information age. According to former CEO of IBM, he said, under, under today's conditions, hierarchical command and control approaches simply do not work anymore. They impede information flows inside companies, hampering the, fl the fluid and collaborative nature of work today. And he speaks about soft power. Can you all say soft power? Soft power. And don't worry, we are going to have a Torah study tonight. Soft power <laughs> rests on the ability to shape the preferences of others to, to want what you want. Don't you agree that that's a more powerful form of leadership when you can influence others to want the same thing that you want, that they'll have the same goals that you have, and they'll carry the same vision that you have? Because leadership in a manner of, of a dictatorship do, does not work today. It, do, it, it doesn't even fit in with Western culture. The collaborative, the collaborative approach is a better approach to leadership. So it's not just a matter of issuing commands, but it, but it involves leading by example and attracting others to do what you want. Mm -hmm. And I think the best example of a leader of, of using soft power is Moshe or Moses himself. The, the, the man that God used to, to take the children of Israel out of Egypt. Yes. So Moses used the approach of soft power to lead the Israelites. And he led through example, and he led through humility. You know, we often think that humility is a weakness. But tonight I want to show you that humility is an, is an example, is a strength. Amen? And it's something that we should all really, we should develop humility among all the other strengths that we, that we desire to achieve. Amen? And to lead by example. Now, the first step to, to becoming a, a, a leader is that you know who you are. The first credential leadership is that you know who you are. Mm -hmm. And I can, think of, I can think of no better scripture for that than Je not, not Genesis, Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. And if you will turn with me to Exodus 1, 
or the Book of Shemot. This is the very first Torah reading in the Book of Exodus, Parsha Shemot, encompassing Exodus 1-1 through Exodus 6-1. And when you have Exodus 1-1, um, please say amen and we'll read that scripture together. Amen. Exodus 1-1. All right, one, two, three. Now these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob. Now the name of the second book of the Bible in Hebrew, the name that Moses gave it, is the book Shemot. Can you say Shemot? Shemot, Shemot means names. The, the Greek name of the book in the Septuagint is the name Exodus. And the word Exodus denotes departure or exit. And so when we study Exodus, all we think about is the departure, and all we remember is coming, you know, coming out, coming to the, you know, coming to the promised land, coming through the Red Sea, exiting the slavery of Egypt. But the focus that Moses gives this book is not the Exodus. The focus, the focus of Moshe or Moses is the names. Can you say names? Because names. the names dem demonstrate that you know who you are. You cannot lead anybody or influence anybody if you don't know who you are and people are not going to know who you are unless you know who you are that you walk in that authority that you know what your calling is in Christ Jesus and, and whether in the church or in the world you, 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 you know what your place is and you know what your place of, of, of authority is and the children of Israel needed a strong leader to help them to actualize their potential because remember, the Israelite, they, this had been over 200 years of bondage within Egypt. And now, can you imagine being born in, 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 into an environment of slavery? And, and being raised in slavery and raising children in slavery? You, you, you're, you're being brought up in a demoralized mindset, and it's very difficult for you to think outside of the confines of slavery. So God raised up a leader who grew up who was raised outside of the influence of slavery. And that was Moses. And Moses was raised in the king's palace. Moses was raised as a prince of Egypt. Moses was, was raised, I mean, he was also raised by, by, by his mother, but he was also, he lived, in, he lived in the palace. So he grew out, he grew up outside of the mindset and the cultural influence of slavery. So God could use somebody from outside of the confines of slavery to set God's people free. And often God will take somebody that hasn't been completely influenced by a slavery or a Mitzrayan mindset to, to, to bring others out of that bondage. Amen? Amen. And the person's name connotates the perp that person's purpose in life. And every one of you has a high calling in God. God is raising up mighty warriors for his kingdom. God's going to raise you up to be used by him. Amen? Amen? And again, I don't want you to limit God to only moving in your spiritual life. I want you to allow God to walk, to move in every single aspect of your life. Everything. Now, some of you know I've been going, I've been going through some very difficult times in the workplace. But you know what? God, God was, even in the midst of that struggle, God was directing our footsteps. Amen. So I encourage you to trust God through every situation you go through. Every single situation. Some of you are developing businesses where you're trusting God. God, should I do it this way or should I do it that way? Should I, should I take this step or this step? Should I involve this person or that person? And you're trusting God every single step of the way. And you don't have 100% clarity every single step of the way. So sometimes you just have to go on, on, in faith and trust God. The Bible is not, is not like a fortune, uh, what do you call those things, those balls? Um, um, crystal balls. It's not like a crystal ball. You're not going to look into those crystal balls and say, today thou shalt do this. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like that. But God does speak to you and God oh. does direct you and God is saying to trust me. I mean, how many times did Thomas Edison fail before he perfected the, the light bulb? He found over a thousand methods that did not work until he finally found that one method that worked. You, and you look at how, how long did it take Colonel Sanders to get a loan for, for, for his Kentucky Fried Chicken recipe? I'm telling you, so, uh, great leaders are made through failure. And I'm telling you, uh, 
And in my book, someone that keeps yeah. trying is not a failure. Amen. Amen. That, that is a person that God is developing into a mighty leader. Amen? Amen. Right. Now, the word, the Hebrew word for the book of Exodus is Shemot. Shemot means names. But there's another word in Hebrew that sounds similar to Shemot, and that's the word Shemama. Can you say that with me? Shemama. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but Shemama means desolation. And so when God brings you to a place where you discern your name and who you are in God, well, guess what? God is removing you from that place of Shemama, of desolation and darkness, and bring you into a place that gives you meaning and direction in life. Amen? You know, last week I gave the example of, a, of, of professions. Now imagine if your profession was every single day you, you clock in to the office and you go out to the, the, the work field and your job is for eight hours per day is to dig a hole. Actually, for six hours a day you're digging a hole. For what purpose? For no purpose. And then for the last two hours of your shift, you fill the hole back up again. Mm. Then you clock out, you go home, you come back the next day, you do the same exact thing again. Every single day. What kind of fulfillment will you experience in life if that were your profession? No. None, no. And in fact, it's, it's going to degrade you. It's going to make you feel worthless. It's going to bring you to a place where you feel you have no value. And I'm telling you, you know, that is the, probably the worst thing you can do a, to a person when they feel like they're living life and they have nothing to contribute to society. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably the worst place to be where you feel like you have no purpose. And that is exactly what Pharaoh did to the Israelites in Egypt. He demoralized them. I mean, first he gave them labor that actually benefited society. Then he, he, he you know, but it, his, his plans did not work out the way he wanted. The children of Israel continued to proliferate, continued to multiply. So then he gave them labor that did not profit. Tonight, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to bring every one of you into a place where your labor profits. And that you receive fulfillment within your professions. That you receive fulfillment in wherever God places you. God, even when God puts you in places of ministry, where God is using you in ministry, that you, come, that you experience tremendous fulfillment in whatever God, God calls you to do. Some of you are called to wake up at 3 o'clock every morning and get on a conference call and pray for all the needs in the ministry. That is a tremendous calling. A tremendous calling. But at 3 a.m., it'll be very hard for you to get a hold of me. <laughs> but many of you in this ministry do that, and God has given you the grace to, to, the grace to do that. Amen. But wherever God places you, God will give you the grace to do what He wants you to do. Amen? Amen. You know, I cannot be a clone of, of Rebitz and Auntie Anita. I cannot be a clone of any of you because God has given every one of you a particular grace. I'm not going to try and imitate you. I, my goal tonight is to help you to flourish and to increase and, and to, to grow in the anointing with the gifts God's given you. Amen? In every area of your life. So, the test is, during this time, is that you develop into a leader wherever God places you. The, fir the, second the first test is that you know who you are. That you know what your name is. Knowing your name is not seeing your name as a label. You know, I heard someone say a while back that your name is whatever you want it to be. You can change your name because it's just a label. I completely disagree with that because your name is not a label. Your name, even though your, your parents gave you a name, and they probably gave you that name because it sounded cute, but within that name, they were actually prophesying what your destiny is. Isn't that amazing that your name shows you who you are in God? And if you take your name back into the original Hebrew, and, and then, the, the, I mean, there's a, prophetic message in the, there's a prophetic message that reveals what your identity is in God. So the first test is that you know who you are. Now there's one thing that God holds higher than His name. Any thoughts? You got it, His Word. It's a very sharp group here tonight. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor Janet. Psalm 138, verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise your name for the loving kindness and for thy truth. For you, has for you have magnified your word above thy name. 
See, God holds higher reverence for His Word than even His name. And there is no higher name than the name of God. Amen? So, if God puts emphasis on His Word, shouldn't we put emphasis on His Word? And when you put the emphasis on His Word, guess what? God will reveal your name to you. Because it's only in the Word of God that you will find out what your name is and what your name means. Amen? Amen. In, in the Word of God, in, your, in the Bible, God will reveal your name to you. Now, the second test, the first test of a leader is that you know who you are. The second test upon a leader is the test of growing up. So tonight, you're all going to grow up, and I'm growing up with you. The test of growing up. Noah, I want you to tell everyone around you, it's time to grow up. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. It's time for us all to grow up. Now, when I say grow up, I'm not speaking about chronological age. I'm speaking about something much greater than that. You can be five years old and be grown up in the context that I'm going to speak to you about tonight. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. Let's read it together. One, two, three. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown... Let's stop, the, let's stop there. He was grown. Do you want to know what grown means? What, what do you think grown means? If you just raise your hand, I'll, I'll call on you. Mature. Pastor Michael? Mature. Mature? Mm-hmm. Um, um, David? He was grown in his mid, in, mid, in his character. Excellent. Any other thoughts? Rebecca Maryland? He was... Great, excellent. Gregory? To walk in the ways of Torah. To walk in the ways of Torah, excellent. Rebbe Gregory? In wisdom. In wisdom. Got a very sharp group here tonight. You're, 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 you're all correct. Mm-hmm. Rebitson? He was grown into the, the full stature of, of God in his character and his knowledge. He was walking in the fullness of Excellent. Let's give Rebitz and Cheryl a hand. That was perfect. That I, I didn't catch. I mean, I, I, he was grown in the full stature of, of God, his full calling in God, and, and, and his character and his midot. You, you, you all got it right, and Rebitz and Marilyn with, with great. Well, let's look at this, the first part of the verse again. It came to pass in those days when Moses was grown. Now, if we, if we were to do biblical forensics here, we would break apart this whole sentence. And it came to pass in those days. And the question you would ask is, what days? So we're not going to do that tonight. That'll be for another study. But I want to focus on Moses being grown. Now, at this time, Moses was probably around 40 years old. So, of course, he's, he's been grown up for quite some time. But the Torah, or the Word of God, is not telling us that Moses was grown up to show us that he was an adult. Because there are many adults that are not grown up. Mm-hmm. The Torah is telling us. I think Rabbi Gregory raised his hand. So, was that for a question? No. Okay. I was confessing. You're confessing. You know? This is a very serious class, as you all know. So, the Torah is telling us that Moses had matured to the full stature, both spiritually and emotionally. Now, the word for grown, the word grown here, is the word in Hebrew is the word gadol. Can you say gadol? Gadol means to grow, to become great or important, to promote, to make powerful, praise, magnify, do great things. So, I mean, with that definition, how many of you want to be called great or grown? I believe all of you do, right? You all want to, and it's not about becoming prideful or people looking at you. It's that you become mature and know who you are in God and step into the calling that God has for your life. Now again, we know that Moses was raised outside the system. He was raised outside of the confines of slavery. Now, let me give you an example in the, in the workplace. You know, if, you, if you've been raised with a mindset that, that you grow up, you go to college, you get a good education, you get a good corporate job, and you work your way through the system of, of, of a corporation. And you get your 2% raises and whatever, but, but you live your entire, you work, you, you, your entire career is within the system of, of a corporation. 
And in a sense, th that becomes almost a type uh, of slavery because you're bound to that system. But there are others that are raised up that when you grow up, I want, I want you to build something. I want you to build wealth. I want, I want, you, to grow, I want you to prosper outside of the system. That, how many of you would rather be in that environment? Amen? I think, I think most, of us, most of us would. So even in your life, you can look at places in your life where there, where there are areas of restriction. There are areas of confinement. You know, you, you may have grown up in a family where nobody in your family has ever gone to college. And maybe no one's even finished high school. Well, guess what? It, within that family structure, your struggle would be to do better than what, what your family has done. That you, you're going to go out of the confines of your system and take your family name to a higher level. I'm not saying anything's good or bad about college. I'm not saying anything like that. But what I'm saying is wh whatever system you're in or whatever confinement you're in, you, you, God can bring you to a place where you're going to go outside of that system. Mm -hmm. The Israelites had lived for two, over 200 years under, in the slavery, under the system of Mitzrayim in Egypt. Now, it's a it takes tremendous deliverance to step out of the confines of slavery to, and to become a free person. I have no concept of, of that transition because I've never lived in slavery. But, for, if, you know, but if you know anyone that's been in slavery, it's, it, it, takes it takes tremendous deliverance to break out of that mindset. And the worst of it is not coming... It's hard to come out of slavery, but it's even harder to get the slavery mindset out of you. Amen? That's the, that's the worst. And then what's even more difficult is, people, and it's probably just as difficult, is what people keep looking at you in that mindset, and that's not the way God sees you. We want to see ourselves the way God sees you. Amen? Now, at this time, God was testing Moses' leadership skills. Because if you're a leader, you must be grown. You must mature. And in order to be great, you need to stand up for social injustice. And God didn't need proof to determine if Moses was ready. Now, if you're, if you're a teacher, or if you have an apprentice, before you give your, your apprentice a real job, you're going to put them to the test, aren't you? Because you want to know if your student is ready. Right, mm -hmm. and on Saturday, um, Bauna had to bear with me. I, I was watching, I was watching the the, the, the first Karate Kid movie. So, you, so you, you, so was <laughs> I don't know why I said that, but <laughs> but was Daniel ready? Was he ready for the fight? And a question I'm asking you: Are you ready? Yeah. Right, and you don't know if you're ready until you're tested. See, God did not need to test Moses to convince himself that. Moses was ready. God, what God was doing was to show Moses, to give Moses the confidence so that Moses knew that he was ready. Amen? Mm. See, God knows everything. God is omniscient. Because so, I used to ask God, God, why do you keep testing me? You already know everything anyway, so why do you bother? To just, let's just skip the test and just give me the... Just, just, the let's, just, let's, just move, let's just move on, God. But, and you know what? God has never answered that prayer. The, the way he answers that prayer is that he gives me another test, and another test, and another test. But God is going to test you to, show, to demonstrate to you so that you know and that you're confident that you are ready. You know, when I watch my little nephew, and, I, and I'm sorry you got to bear with me talking about, about my little nephew all the time, but he gets so excited when he learns something new. He's so excited. And I bet Noah's the same way. It's that when you learn something new, how excited do you get? Because it's exciting to learn things. It's exciting to learn and, and to achieve things in life. I'm looking forward to my very first karate match. <laughs> so, sorry. So the first test is that you know who you are. You know your name. The, 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 the second test is that you're grown, that you're mature, that you become a gadol. Now the third test, and I know our sister uh, Vicky has done this, the test of looking upon the burdens of others. Yes. 
and I'm being serious. I've seen nobody like Vicky who's been so concerned about souls and been, been concerned about other people. And how she's become such a soul winner and how God is going to use her this year like you've never imagined. You talk to me? Yes. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, me too, that's how I feel. Isn't it awesome? Yeah. I, I so the, 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 the test of looking upon the burdens of others. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise for that. Yes. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. We're going to read part B of the verse, beginning with the word that. Can you read it with me? That yes. he went out unto his brethren... And looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. Now, in this verse, Moses lives up to his name. Remember, I said you need to know who you are. Moses' name, the name that was given to him by Queen Batia, princess of Egypt, she named him Moses or Moshe, and Moshe means to draw out. So, just as he was drawn out of the water. Well, guess what? God used him to draw the Hebrews out of Egyptian bondage. And look at what he does. He went out, because this is proof. This part B of verse 11 shows us the credentials of Moses' leadership. He went out to his brethren. He, and he doesn't just stop there. He looked at their burdens. And then... He goes a step further. He spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew. He went on a reconnaissance re re mission. Uh -huh, uh -huh. See, that, that is an attribute of a leader. You know, if you have a leader or a so-called leader that could really care less about those that, uh, that are under his or her, or her influence, the subjects of the employees will have very, res very little respect for that leader because people can see right through, uh, you know, um, a superficiality, right? I mean, you, you can see right through it. If somebody's in it just for their money, you can pick that up right away. But if somebody is there that really genuinely, genuinely, genuinely cares, you can pick that up right away. It doesn't take a lot of discernment, but you can, you can tell the truth and the false. So Moses lives up to his name. You know, it takes a lot of work to spy somebody else out. You know, you're actually going in, in stealth mode. You don't want others to know what you're doing. But, you, but the, you're, the reason for, your, for that mission, for that spying out, is to really see how the people are being treated. You know, I, I heard a story about one, one guy who's a CEO of a company. No, he's not the CEO. He's actually the owner of the company. He appointed somebody else to be the CEO. But what he would do is, it was a construction company. He would go out in, into the workplace and work as one, of the, as one of the workers to see how they were being treated. And he would get to hear the complaints about the boss and about the company. And none of them knew that he was the actual owner of the company. Wow. <laughs> An undercover yeah, yeah. boss. But you know why he did that? Because he really cared about his people. He wanted to make sure that we were treated properly. He wanted to make sure that they were, they were receiving the, the right pay, the right compensation, and that the families were being taken care of. Awesome. And I, so I thought that was pretty awesome. When I first heard it, I thought, that was, that's pretty sneaky. But when I, when I talked to the guy and, I, and he explained to me why he did it, I thought that was actually, a, I thought that was brilliant. Yes. And so that was Moses. Moses took the time to identify with his people. He could have stayed in the palace because he was, according to a midrash, according to rabbinic commentary, Moses was in charge of Pharaoh's palace. But he, he, did, not, he, did, he did not, that was not, that's not where his heart was. His heart was to protect his people. So as a leader, you cannot turn a blind eye to the truth, but you must really be connected to the people. And Moses passed this test with flying colors. He passed that test. And that's the very first test of a leader, or in this case, the third test. The third test is that you, know, that, you, that you identify with the pain of other people. You know, um, one of the secrets to starting a business is that, that, you, that you find pain points. And then you address and find solutions to the pain points. You know, I can come up with a great product, the, great, the best product in the world, and I can say, Brother Ed, I want you to market this product. 
And Ed will come back to him and says, nobody in the world needs this product. Well, how, far, how well is that product going to sell? It's not going to sell. Ed can sell it, but it's probably, Ed's probably the only one that can sell it. A 60-inch iPhone. <laughs> like I said, something that nobody'd ever need. So if you, so if you're gonna make, <laughs> so if you're gonna make a product, you, you you need to identify with the needs of others. That's a silly example, but what I want you to do, I want you to learn how to identify with the hurts and the pain of others. Amen. And even though Moses was raised in Pharaoh's palace, he did not turn a blind eye towards his brethren. He saw a Hebrew being mistreated, and he defended the, the, the Hebrew. So this is the first day. So the entire verse reads, you can read it with me if you like. And it came to pass in those days, when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren, and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. Now we, now we know that he slew the Egyptian that was attacking the Hebrew. Now, I want to bring out rabbinic commentary here because Moses was not a murderer. And he did not kill the Egyptian in a rage. What the rabbis tell us is that he spoke out a name of God and God slew the Egyptian. So, Because uh, so, often when we read the word and we read, at, we read at the surface level, we start thinking that Moses is a very angry man and very bitter and just, and just always complaining. That's not Moses. Moses was one of the greatest prophets the world has ever known. One of the greatest men of God. And he was a man that God chose to be the giver of the Torah to, the, to Israel and to, and to us, to the world. Amen? So he looked, he passed this test as well. Are you ready for another test? The only thing I can promise you in this class is that it's going to be a test after the test. A test after the test. And I only heard one amen in that. A test after the test. But my prayer is, Lord, only, please only send me the test that I'm ready for. Amen. See, I mean, look at how deliberate the writing is here. It says that Moses spied out an Egyptian. I mean, he really took the time to see how his people were being treated. And to spy somebody out takes a lot of work. Now let's go to Exodus chapter 2, verse 13. This is the second day. And this time, two Hebrew men strove together. And it says, And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy brother? So here's Moses telling the one that's in the, in, in the, in the wrong, Why are you hitting your, your, your brother? And the other says, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill us the way you killed the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Do you want to understand this text in a little deeper sense? Because mm -hmm. yes. right. you understand it in the, in the simple understanding sense. Let's go a little bit deeper. In verse 13, when Moses goes out, before he saw this conflict, Moses was meditating in his heart. And he, he was asking this question. In what area has Israel sinned that they should be enslaved more than all the other nations? He was pondering this. And, and, and one of the attributes of a leader is, a leader is one that's given to much meditation and much thought and much contemplation. Now, these two men, that these two Hebrew men that were fighting, were, like, were, were really a... Um, a thorn in Moses' side. Mm -hmm. These two men were Dayton and Avram, who caused much trouble for Moses throughout his leadership in, in, in the wilderness. Exodus 16, 20, and Numbers chapter 16. You know, God's going to place people around you that are going to make your life very difficult. Mm -hmm. They may be th people that you may not appreciate very much, but you know what? I, I don't want you to see these folks as people that you need to take out and remove from their position. 
You know, if, if, if Rabitz and Terry is giving me a hard time, mm -hmm. I should not look for opportunities to take her out or remove her, remove her from her position. Right. And I can pick on her because she lets me do that. <laughs> I want you to see people that make your life difficult as opportunities for you to grow. So I don't want you going to the prayer and praying these I, I, I don't want to call, call them what, I, what, what they are, but I don't want you to go out and pray prayers. God, take this one out, take that one out, and put this one in. And move. You, you know, this is not your chess game. This is God's chess game. And God's not playing a game. God is, is moving with, under divine providence. Amen? So allow God to do what He wants to do. Amen. I mean, allow Him to move. I've watched, I've, I've been in this ministry since 1991, and, I, and I've seen how God has positioned people and shifted people around, moved people around, elevate folks, and it, it's just, I've just seen how God moves in Dr. Michelle Corral's ministry, and it's just, it's completely directed by divine providence, completely. And I encourage you all to trust in divine providence that God is in control. Amen. Yeah. I was in a place just on Monday and Tuesday where I had two offers placed before me. I go, Lord, do I take this one or that one? Mm -hmm. Every 30 seconds, I just change my mind. Mm -hmm. Well, this one looks better. No, this one looks better. And I could justify to Bob and my wife at that moment which, why one was better than the other. In the end, I pick one. I go, Lord, I believe you're leading me in this direction. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Because we, I just have to trust them every single step of the way. Amen. And even the place that I come into is a temporary place. Because God is moving the pieces around. I'm, I'm nothing but a pawn on, on the chessboard. Mm -hmm. Sister Kiyoshana, that would be a great title for a song. I'm nothing but a pawn. <laughs> and you'd have to play ch learn how to play chess to know what a pawn is. So these, these two men, Dayton and Avram, Caught were nothing but trouble to Moses, and they stirred up the flock. <coughs> Have you ever seen that happen in in the workplace or in ministry yes. or in your business, where there's always someone there that's stirring things yeah. up? Now, years ago, um, I used to uh, t t um, help take care of, of one of my dad's uh, apartment complexes, and there was one tenant that had nothing else better to do than to stir up conflict. It was like non-stop. There was always something wrong every single day. And I, it, was so, it, was so, it was so frustrating. And, I'm t and at that time, I go, Lord, just take that person out. Just remove that tenant. Let's evict that tenant. But you know, but you know sometimes that, that, that person is your test. And you need, you need to learn how to, you, you get to work on great skills. Forgiveness. <laughs> patience. <laughs> hesed. And sometimes you need to exercise a little strength. That means, because moving in humility and loving kindness does not mean that you become a pushover. Yeah. It means that you set boundaries. Right. And that you establish rules and that there be discipline. That means no trash in the common areas. That there's, there's rules that are there for a reason. Amen? But I, I want you to take these things in your life and, and allow God to use these things to develop you and to mold you and to, and to, and to move, develop you into the person that God wants you to be. Because it, gaining skills in the little things are, are what you need to get promoted in the big things. Amen? It's the little things that will prove you. The little things. So don't wait for the big test, because life is really a bunch of small tests. Mm -hmm. And when the big test comes, the big test is not really a big deal because you've passed so many little tests along the way, way and you have the confidence to, to move on. Mm -hmm. And then verse 14, it says, Surely this thing is known. Surely this thing is known does not only mean that everybody knew what Moses did. Midrashically, it says, it became known to Moses why the Jews deserved to suffer. They quarreled and carried tales about one another. That, that, that's one opinion that I just shared with you. 
So we, you've seen Moses pass a series of tests. Guess what comes next? Let's all say it together. Another yes. test. Because yes. yes. the tests do not end and the test is for your best. So the test, the next test, is about receiving divine revelation. See, in the natural he passed the test and he, dis he discerned and he identified with the sufferings of his Hebrew brethren. Do, do you all agree? Yes. Well, when you pass the test in the natural, now you're being promoted and now the test is to, is to see if you have spiritual discernment. The spiritual test will not come until you pass the natural test. So Moses, being fully grown, had passed the natural test. Now he's ready for the ne next test. And that test is the spiritual test. And that is, a text, that is a test of receiving divine revelation. So now let's turn to Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 4. Let's read this together. <clears throat> 1, 2, 3. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire, out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside. Let's stop there. What does he do? He turns aside. He doesn't just see that fire, that, the bush burning and go, wow, the bush is burning. He looks at it. And then he notices, this bush is burning, but it's not consumed. And Moses says, I will now turn aside. And he sees the great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And then look what takes place in verse 4. Let's read this together. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called out to him in the midst of the bush. Let's stop there. See, God was paying attention. And when God saw that Moses turned to look and to discern what was taking place and why the bush was not consumed by the fire, see, he passed that test as well. Because he inquired about the spiritual matter. You know, he could have just looked at this and just, oh, it's just a burning bush, it's not consumed, and kept going. No, he, he took the time to discern and to seek what was going on here. And then he passed that test and then God says, Moses, Moses, and he responds, here I am. This, the Midrash Rabbah says, at the time of this incident, Moses was pondering the Jewish people's situation and that the Egyptians might consume Israel. You see, his heart is consumed with the difficulties and the pains of his own brethren. The cruel, excruciating bondage that they're under. And he's consumed and cares so much for his people. See, Moses did not have to care about his people. He, 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 had, he had a free ticket. He could live his life as an Egyptian and eventually rule over Egypt and not even worry about the slaves. But no, he, he was always pondering the state of his brethren, of his people. And that's what God, when, before God elevates you, he, he, he waits to see that you're ready and that you have a heart for His people. And sometimes when God elevates some people, they forget where they came from and, 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 just, and, and just move on with, with, without any regard or consideration for, for others. That is not biblical leadership. Biblical leadership is a leadership style where, you're, where you carry the burdens of others and you raise others out of their place of affliction. And that thorn bush, you know, that bush that was not consumed, it represents Israel. And God was showing Moses that even though they are in, that they are in fiery affliction, they will not be consumed. And that's God's promise to you. No matter what affliction you go through, you will not be consumed. This was Moses' very first prophetic vision. And God's going to bring you into places where you are going to experience prophetic vision as well. Verse 5, God tells Moses, um, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Amen. Removing the shoes represents that Moses 
gives himself completely to the call of God without any reservation, without any impediment between himself and the holy ground. The, the, the time's going to come where you're going to take the shackles off and move forward in the call, in, into the call of God in your life. Amen? And when you give yourself to God without reservation, guess what takes place? God's going to reveal His name to you. Remember the first part in, Gen in Exodus 1.1, these are the names, speaking about your name. But now God's going to reveal His name to you. So in Exodus 3.14, God says to Moses, I am that I am. Now for years, I used to struggle with this. Every time I read God saying I am, it didn't make sense to me because all I could think about was when I, as a kid, watching the Popeye cartoons where saying I, I am that I am and Popeye the Sailor Man or whatever that <laughs> script was. <Yeah. laughs> and see, and, and, and often our understanding of the Word of God is at the cartoon level or at, this, at, a very, at a superficial level. I am that I am is a name of God in which God identifies with the suffering of His people. In Revelation, Jesus reveals himself to John as the I am. Because he's saying that I am with you in your affliction. I am with you. Amen. And I'm going to bring you out of, 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 of that fire. And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, you shall, he says, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. And what God was saying to Moses is, Go and say to Israel, I am with you in your servitude. I am with you in the servitude of other kingdoms. Meaning that I am in every single exile you go through. God was prophesying to Moses, When you're in this, within this exile of Egypt, I am, I am. In the exile in the future, in the Babylonian exile, I am. When you're in the exile with the, with the, um, the Medes and Persians, I am. When you're in the Greek exile, I am. And when you're in the Roman exile, I am. The Jews are still in the fourth exile. The fourth and final exile is the Roman exile. And that exile will not end until Messiah returns. When Jesus comes or Yeshua returns, that the fourth exile will come to an end. So God is saying, I am in every exile. I am. Because the way we know God is by His deeds. I am called by my deeds. So when God, when God said to Moses, you want to know my name? Well, God will reveal His name to you in the area that you need the, the, you need the deliverance. Amen. Or the name Amen. that you need, or in the place that you need the, the Yeshua. So we know God by different names. One name is El Shaddai. Another name is, is uh, Tezev. Zavakot, another name is Elohim, and another name is Havaya, another name is Hashem. The, the name Elohim, Elohim, it means when I judge my creatures, I am called Elohim. Mm -hmm. It's the name that, de that denotes God's strict justice. Of course, saying Elohim is a mispron is a mispron it's an, it's an intentional mispronunciation of God's holy name so that I don't desecrate His holy name. That's a concept we learn about on Monday nights with Dr. Corral. It's called a Kiddush Hashem. The second name here is a Tezevakot. And it, mean, and it says, when I wage war on the wicked, I am called Tezevakot. The third name is the name El Shaddai. Can you say El Shaddai? El Shaddai. What do you think El Shaddai means? The all sufficient one? Excellent. The many breasted one. I haven't heard that name before. That, uh, any others? More than enough. More than enough. I'm going to shock you for a second. Do you mind if I shock you? Yes. All right, I'm going to shock you. When I tolerate the sins of man, I am called El Shaddai. It derives from the word sufficient. It denotes God as the one who sets limits on creation by establishing the laws of nature, the limitations within which the universe functions. It also represents God's establishment of limits to, to the success one enjoys and the sufferings one must endure. 
The Ramban says that El Shaddai describes God when he performs miracles that do not openly disrupt the normal course of nature. God disguises himself like in the Feast of Purim. It also represents how much God will tolerate sin in your life. So you can only test God so far. And the name and see these are all the meanings of El Shaddai. And it does mean that he's more than enough. But the Hebrew meaning of El Shaddai is 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 that it does mean that he, he's sufficient, but it also denotes that God sets limits. Isn't that amazing? Yes. You know what I really like about this one is that God set limits to the testings that I'll go through. Yes. Yes. So whenever I'm in the fire, I go, Lord, you are El Shaddai. Please let this trial end today. How many of you can tell I'm going through a test right now? Yeah. All right. The, the, the next name, Havaya. Havaya. And that name denotes when I have compassion on my world, I am called Havaya. It represents his compassion. The next name is the name Hashem. The name Hashem represents God as the one who carries out His promises. Hashem means the name. And the, the last name that we're going to talk about here is I Am. Also known by the, the four-letter name of God, uh, which I won't pronounce tonight. But the, the I Am. Now God who, who prepares to fulfill His pledge to free Israel and bring them to the promised land. And it's a name that God reveals in the midst of your affliction. See, God did not reveal the fullness of this name to the patriarchs. The fullness of this name was revealed to Moses. Because Moses had such a high level of prophecy. And because of his high level of prophetic understanding, God was able to reveal to him even greater degrees of, 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 of his name. The more sensitive you are to God, the more God can reveal to you. But the key is that you must remain humble. Moses was called in scripture as the most humble man on the face of the earth. So the, 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 the higher that you ascend spiritually and even in the natural, the more grounded you need to, be, need to be with the attribute of humility. It doesn't matter if I can hold services where millions of people get, get healed. Because it's not me. It's, it, whatever God does, it's all Him. And I must learn how to walk in that place that it, even if I achieve tremendous wealth, it's not me. It's for His glory. It's for Him. And, and of course, God will bless me. God will bless all of you. But you know what? It's not so that I may get puffed up. Because God can snatch that wealth in, in, a, in an instant. If you don't believe me, read the story of Job. Job was one of the richest men in, 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 in the world, I should say. The name I am that I am means that God is with Israel in their cruel subjugations to the Egyptian taskmasters. And he's with them through all future exiles. Mm -hmm. The church was in exile in the book of Revelation. And as Jesus is prophesying to the seven churches, he reveals himself first as, I am that I am. Mm -hmm. The holy name of God connotating that I'm with you in the midst of that subjugation. Mm -hmm. If you're going through a cruel divorce, he is, I am that I am. And He's with you through that difficult situation. If you're going through something very difficult in your, in your health, I'm with you in the midst of that. You're fighting cancer. You're, you're fighting sickness. Whatever you're fighting, I am that I am. You have a tumor on your body. I am that I am. He's with you in the midst of that affliction. Amen? Amen. Amen. Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and, and, and Omega. Let's, let's, let's translate the Greek words into Hebrew. I am the Aleph and the Tav. Mm -hmm. And also in Hebrew concept, I am that I am. And just as God was with John, he's, he was with Moses, and he's with you. 
and I can go on for another hour, but I'm going to conclude. <laughs> How many of you are going through a very difficult time right now? If you're on Facebook, I would encourage you just to maybe just, maybe just type yes, or give me a smiley, or, 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 a, or not a smiley. Could you raise your hands again, please? Just about half of you. And, and, and do, you, do you want me to show you how to, how to fight this battle? Amen. All right. Can you give me another, another 10 minutes? Yeah. All right. Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 16. This is the test of listening. I think the most difficult thing for any leader to do is to be a good listener. A good leader must be a listener. And I don't know very many good listeners. Listening, I think, is the most difficult skill to, to master. So let's read this together. Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 16. Let's read. And when Moses drew, I'm sorry, when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. Wherefore have you dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? And we'll, we'll stop there. And then later on, Moses says, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Can you imagine this? Here you are, Pharaoh. No, not Pharaoh. Here you are, Moses. And Pastor Michael, you can be Moses for a moment. Here you are, Moses. And you've, I mean, and you've lived a life of such sacrifice and really identifying with the, with, with the people. And you're leading 2.5 million people out of Egypt. And now, now get this, Pastor Michael. You bring them to the foot of the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds, which is the more accurate translation. They're at the... They're, they're at, on one side is the water, and then the other side is the most powerful army in the world coming against you with the chariots of iron. And you have two and a half million people with you, most of them with, with a slavery mindset, crying out to you and complaining. And, 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 it, it's, and the ownership is on you to, to lead the people. I mean, it looks like you, let, you, you have led the people to, to commit the greatest suicide of, of human history. How many of you think that was a difficult place? A very difficult place. Now, as a leader like, like Moses, is this the time to exercise listening skills? If you were to ask me, I'd say no. But this is the most important time to identify with your people and to listen to their complaints. Now, using a Midrash source, the Israelites faced four faces of fear. Can you say four faces of fear? And I'm going to share this with you because I think we all face this from time to time. Of course, you're not at the Sea of Reeds, but in your own personal, in your own personal struggle. The first face of fear is self-sabotage. Self and one elder in the camp cries out to the people, let's commit mass suicide. Makes sense, doesn't it? We can either be killed by the Pharaoh and his chariots and the soldiers, or we can drown in the sea. So let's kill ourselves. And, and they're saying it's better to die by our own hands than to be murdered by our former masters. Self-sabotage. Some of us do this in our careers, in our marriages, in our relationships, that we just self-sabotage what God is doing for us. What is Moshe's response as the great leader and the great listener? He says, do not fear. Moses is telling the people that they must acknowledge that they are afraid and then just to trust. Do not fear. Because their crying out was rooted, the self-sabotage was rooted in fear and Moses responds with, do not fear. The second group in the camp is saying, retreat. You know, it's much easier, you know, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place Let's return back to Egypt and things will be like our former lives. For those that come out of a bondage, whether it's sexual abuse or any type of abuse, it, it's very difficult for those, for those that are abused, even 
um, a, a wife that's been abused by a husband, it's, it's often very difficult for the abused person to run away from that, from that bondage. Because it's easier to stay in that bondage than to run away. And, and that, that is the retreat mindset. And what, what does Moses, Moses respond? He says, no, don't retreat. You will see them no more. So the way Moses com comforts them is by telling them, you will see your cruel taskmasters no more. The third group says, fight. That sounds admirable, doesn't it? Let's fight. But it depends on how you fight. They're fighting in the sense, they're, they're fighting out of fear. It, it looks admirable on, on the surface saying, look, we're going to fight, we're going to stand up. But that's not, what God's, that's not God's commandment. God's not telling them to fight because in, for this deliverance to take place, it's not going to take place through fighting. And Moses tells them, he instructs them, he says, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. But these people are crying out saying, free men must fight for their freedom. And you know what? There, there, is, there are times that you must fight for your freedom. I mean, how did the United States obtain its freedom? Uh, Amer the Americans fought for their freedom. But in this situation, with the Israelites come out of, coming out of Egypt, th their fight was not to fight with weapons of war. They were to stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. The fourth one, the fourth um, group of people were saying, were performing what, what I call learned helplessness. Can you say it with me? Learned helplessness. And this is what this, 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 is what this voice says to us. We, we did not free ourselves from slavery. We were never in control. Our only path is to remain motionless, close our eyes, and pray to God. Now, it sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, they said, let's pray to God. But you know what? Their prayer to God was not rooted in faith. Yeah. Their prayer to God was, close my eyes. I'm not in control anyway. I've never been in control. And I'm just going to close my eyes and pray to God. See, th th they're not praying to God for deliverance. They're just shut, th they are shutting down. They are shutting down. And that's probably the worst place you can be, because fear can bring you to a place that you just shut down. I have seen people that have gone through so many trials, so many afflictions, and they don't know how to cope with it that they just shut down. It's like taking your Alexa device and unplugging it from the wall. But you just shut down. It's a learned form of helplessness. It's not rooted in faith, but it's rooted in fear. And when you pray, I want you to examine your prayer life. Are your prayers to God rooted in faith, or are they rooted in fear? That's a difficult one. I can't answer that question for you, and it's one I encourage you all to ponder. And it's a question that I'm pondering in my life as well. Is, is, are my prayers rooted in faith? Because sometimes I don't think my prayers are always faithful prayers. Sometimes my prayers are rooted in fear. But we need to allow the Holy Spirit to take this word that you're receiving tonight from Exodus chapter 14 and allow the Lord to show you the areas of fear that you need to work through. You, you, have, you can self-sabotage, you can retreat, you can fight, or you can practice learned help, helplessness. And tonight, Lord God, I ask that we'll move forward without fear, and that we'll stand sit still and see the salvation of the Lord. But the remedy for all your problems is found in the Word of Truth. The remedy is in the Word of God. I encourage all of you, do, do not treat the Bible like a bunch of vitamin containers. Magnesium, vitamin C, vitamin D, a multivitamin complex. If you were to go into our uh, medicine drawer, you'd see countless uh, vitamins. But I don't want you to treat the Word of God like a bunch of vitamins. I want you to allow to God to, to show you your life within the context of Scripture and allow Him to give you the battle plan for anything that you're going through in life. Even the Holy Spirit can show you, uh, how many of you have kids? How many of you have brothers and sisters? 
You have relationships. Allow God to show you even how you address everything in life through the Word of God. I mean, He'll give you the entire story of your life through the lives of one, through the lives of one of the patriarchs. You know, you may look at David and be so, so connected with the readings on David, and the Lord may be showing you that your suffering is very much like David. But you know what? The greater the suffering, the greater the glory. And look at the test that God gave. Actually, I'm going to stop here. I'll save this for next time. Because he, 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 his life was one test after another. And guess what? Your life is one test after another. Amen? I'm going to invite you all just to stand with me. Lord, tonight we thank you, Lord God, for tonight's Torah teaching. Lord, I ask you to deliver us from every form of fear that we're facing right now, Lord God. I'm praying for healing and deliverances to take place for everyone that's here in this word tonight, Lord God. And I thank you, Lord God, for your goodness and your greatness. And Lord, I just ask you to bless your people, Father God. And Lord, deliver them from every place of restriction. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise.